famous good friend, Gina Bianchini. Gina, I have known since she took my class at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and graduated in the year 2000. I like to say, describe Gina as someone who was into entrepreneurship before entrepreneurship was cool. Gina now runs a company which she founded called Mighty Networks. Prior to that, Gina was involved in a startup with Mark Andreessen called Ning. And Gina, even though most people don't know this, along with Sheryl Sandberg, Gina was extraordinarily instrumental in founding the organization Lean In and starting Lean In Circles, which we're going to talk about a little about that also. So welcome to the Pfeffer on Power podcast, Gina. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for having me, but you forgot the most important aspect of my bio, which is that I am a registered fangirl of all of your books and your teachings, and I think have regularly sought you out since graduating from the GSB to have lunch or dinner to talk about um, the applications of power in real life, which I think what's been so interesting to me is how relevant your principles are and how much of any GSB class that I took, I think about them. And in my role as fangirl, I actually have a couple of questions for you in this podcast. Okay. Topic. So before we talk, ask you questions, you can ask yeah. me a question. Okay. Absolutely. So you know, one of the things that, that you talk a lot about um, and you have used is stories of people like um, LBJ, Lyndon Johnson. You've used stories of politicians and, you know, corporate leaders. And we're sitting in what feels like a very interesting moment in terms of the two people at the top of the two political parties in the United States both have flaws, both feel like, oh, oh, because the other person that you also talk a lot about, and I totally remember, is um, the founder of CBS. And, you know, the dynamic between um, Paley and Frank Stanton and like, him holding on to power for a really long time. So as you are looking as the professor of power at the current situation that we're in, you know, a week after the debates, what is your take on not so much like, you know, whether Biden should drop out or Trump or anything, but just from a power lens, what the heck is going on? Um, well, we could have a long podcast just on that, but um, I know. So I, I know. know. So, 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 since you asked, I will try to be to give you a succinct answer. Um, I think I think there are several things in play. Number one, leaders, as you and you know, and we're going to actually talk about this with respect to you. One of the jobs of a leader is to communicate, and one of the jobs of a leader is to inspire confidence. One of the things that you and I have talked about. As a startup founder, startup founders have face setbacks. Startup founders face things that don't go smoothly. And one of the things that startup founders have to do, and which I think you have done extraordinarily effectively, is to communicate confidence, even if they don't necessarily know every answer, even if, and for those of you who can't see you, Gina's nodding her head, yes. Yeah, so, so the, the, to, to inspire confidence and to be able to motivate and energize your team and your customers and your investors, even if you don't know what you're doing, even if you're not sure things are going to be successful. So communication is a fundamentally essential part of leadership. And, um, and therefore, the ability to communicate with force and effectiveness and energy is, is important. I think Biden's debate, debate performance was bad, but Biden had problems energizing the crowd even prior to the debate and, in the, and, in the, and independent of the debate. And I think, you know, I think Trump illustrates another principle, which is we respond, my colleague Baba Shiv will tell you this, we respond primarily on the basis of, of, of emotion. And emotion is important. 
And the content of what we say, you know, my friend Deborah Gunfeld, who's also been on this podcast, Deborah Gunfeld will tell you that in communication, how you look is important, how you sound is important, and the content of what you say is by far the least important. And, um, and that may be sad, but, uh, but it is also true. So, so I think, you know, my, another person who's been on this podcast, Dana Carney. Dana Carney is writing a book on body language. Body language is important. Posture is important. How your gestures are important. All of these things and how you sound is important. So all of these things are very, very important. And I think that helps to explain part of what is going on in the world and why Biden is not coming across um, properly because he does not he does not feel energetic and uh, you know and I think his voice is not as good as it used to be and uh, and so on and so forth so um, so I so I, th I think you know seven rules of power the book I wrote uh, if you were to read that book and think about it, how does this apply to Donald Trump uh, versus Joe Biden I think you will actually uh, come up with a good answer. You have, you have oh, any yeah. questions for me or can I ask you some questions? You can now ask me questions. That's fine. Oh, okay, good. Anyway. That was a good answer too. Thank that you. That was a good answer. I'm I was going to say, it's as if you've actually studied this for a very, very long time. Yeah, that's good. All right. <laughs> so tell me about your current organization, how long it's been around and what its purpose is. It's called Mighty Networks. It was originally, I think, called Mighty Bell. That was the company before it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so tell me about tell me about your entrepreneurial journey with Mighty Networks, what it is doing and uh, and why sure. you founded it and kind of what's what it's about. Yeah. So, you know, going back to the prior company I worked on uh, called Ning, what I realized was every single thing that I had done from being just a little girl until the moment I sort of figured out that I wanted to work in technology that enables communities, I feel led to this moment. And specifically, I have such clarity that my mission is to live in a world where everybody, everybody on the planet has the opportunity to join and be a part of not one, but multiple absolutely amazing communities for their professional opportunities and goals and network, for their you know, personal aspirations, for their interests, their passions, their goals. And if I do my job right and my team thankfully is, is hard at work on this and believes in this vision as well, which is how do we create the conditions through software, which actually scales to everybody on the planet with a phone, uh, with a computer, with access to a, the digital network uh, of the internet. How do we actually use software to make those connections so that anybody can join a community and instantly feel welcome, instantly meet the most interesting people and, and certainly the people who are the most relevant to what they want to accomplish or the transition that they're in and navigating that transition? That's our vision. And so what we do at Mighty Networks is we offer a software platform that anybody can show up and create a Mighty Network and choose a community, courses, events, challenges, being able to bring those different things together that ultimately create a network that gets more valuable to every member with each new person who joins and contributes. So if you've ever heard of Shopify, uh, and what Shopify has done for e-commerce, putting the creator or the brand first, uh, really allowing software that, that you own and you can build your stuff out on, we want to take that model and do it for community, for courses, for challenges, for events. And, you know, in, in Silicon Valley, 
this is called a network effect, which is happens to be the most valuable thing that you can build. Like it is, well, let me say that one more time. It happens to be the most valuable thing that you can build. And what's interesting to me is, you know, you think about the creators, the tens of millions of creators all over the world, they're all building content to build audiences. And it's like the thing we've known in Silicon Valley going back 50 years is you don't want an audience if you can have a network and, it, and specifically a network effect that grows itself, which is the foundation of everything from Facebook to Instagram to Twitter to uh, YouTube and more. So that's what we do at Mighty. It really comes from a place of um, passion and belief in there is so much that technology is going to be able to do that we're in the process of building right now to not just help people have valuable relationships and achieve goals that they never thought were possible, but also if we do our jobs right, hopefully help people make the best friends of their lives. Okay. So one of the things that you and I have discussed over the years is what is the difference between Mighty Networks and other organizations, which I believe would tell, would say, though I don't think they necessarily do, the same thing. So people will tell you that uh, a Facebook group has essentially the same objective, or LinkedIn has some of the same objective, which is to yeah. connect people with similar interests. What is the difference between Mighty Networks and some of your and some of these other organizations? Yeah, it's a great question. So the best way to think about it is when you create a Facebook group. Most people, 99% of the people that are experiencing your Facebook group are experiencing it one post at a time, threaded through everything else they're doing on their, on their newsfeed. And what we do at Mighty Networks is actually create a separate entity altogether on your own branded apps, on your own branded website, all integrated into one experience such that you essentially go to that mighty network. And again, it can be for a specific purpose under a specific brand and the connections that you're making in that environment. We're the only platform that actually is invested in how do people who don't know each other actually meet. So, it doesn't mean that you can't use a Facebook group to try to get there, but it's a little bit like, you know, trying to ride a bicycle across the United States. You can do it, but it's a lot harder when you could actually just fly on a plane. Mm -hmm. So I think the best way to think about it, and, and again, the movement certainly online that, that people are moving from social media into private communities, into online spaces that are dedicated to a particular interest. That is a movement that's happening. But it's, you know, if you if you want to set up a, a store, do you want to set it up on Amazon? Totally valid way of doing it. Or do you want to set it up on Shopify where it's under your brand? It is, it's yours. Yeah. There are pros and cons to, to both. Um, we happen to think that there's a lot more pros to the model where you have your own network effect that you can brand as your own and you can create the relationships between members away from the clutter, the noise, the chaos, the toxicity of social media platforms. Um, but I think that's probably the best way to think about no, it no, is like, do you no, want to, I, do you want to like sell on Amazon answer. or do you want to have your website? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so when I think back about you and what I think our listeners can learn from you, um, you, I think, have many of the attributes I associate with power. So when you, after, after you had founded Ning with Mark Andreessen, who of course has gone on uh, to run this big VC firm and is known for his um, you know, work uh, starting one of the first uh, you know, websites inside of platforms um when you i still remember you telling me the story of you going up and down sand hill road even though you had been associated with mark and with ning which had been a relatively large organization and everybody looked at you and said who the hell are you 
And so one of the qualities that I think you exemplify is in fact resilience and persistence. And so talk a little bit about how you have built, you know, I think, I think, I think resilience and persistence is important because everybody does face disappointments and setbacks. Could you speak a little about how you have built yeah. your disability to overcome, you know, I, I, uh, overcome rejection, overcome people saying, you know, who are you or, you know, why would I invest in you or whatever? But you have, you have persisted. I think Mighty Networks has been not always the easiest thing to get off the ground, but you've gotten it off the ground. Talk yeah. about how you did that. Yeah. So I think one of the most important realizations that I had, and I, I continue to relearn this, which is life is not fair. Life is not fair. And I think that the, the frustration comes in the moments where you think that life should be fair and then it's not. And the, the analogy that, that I've used is if you go through life thinking that, you know, it, it's about what is fair or not fair, it's like putting a bag of rocks on your back and trying to like walk at altitude with a super heavy, sometimes unnecessary bag on you and you're like dragging it along. So I feel like once I figured out that life is not fair and that nothing is owed to me, that made the whole thing. And especially like, you know, I still do sales. Like that's kind of your job. I mean, you and I've talked about this is like your job as a, as a founder is, and, and for some reason it's, it's in vogue now to use this term founder led sales. And it's like, well, there's never a moment in time where you're not the most important salesperson in the company. Um, but I, I think that it's when I have assumed that something should be fair or easy. It's never going to be easy. And so that was actually really helpful. And then the other thing that I would say is, you know, from a pretty early age, I had things happen, you know, and it's not, you know, my, my dad was killed when I was 11. Um, and it was, you know, such a before and after in my life. And, and actually it was, it was a moment in a time where my community around me in Cupertino really came together, um, to support me, support my family. And, um, I feel incredibly lucky to have grown up in the place that I grew up at the time and, and moment I did. Uh, so as I think about that experience, thinking about playing sports, thinking about, you know, seeking out higher and higher challenges or bigger and bigger challenges in my life. Like I don't mind hard work. I'm not afraid of the grind. I am very comfortable choosing a very hard path. And it doesn't mean that I don't have days where I'm just like, this is not fair or I'm working too hard or like, why have I made the life choices? Why have I made the life choices that I have made? Uh, but I think, what has really kept me going in the context of Mighty Networks is I very much want to live in this world. I want to live in a world where every creator, every brand, every person who wants this incredibly powerful asset to be able to make a living, to have an impact, to help people, it's too important to be, to be set back. And it's too important um, to leave it up to the people that would otherwise do it. And, you know, is there ego involved in that? Probably. Um, that's okay. Like, you know, if that's what allows me to get up tomorrow morning and move this forward, then I embrace it. Uh, I, I think it's important to check it, but you've got to be, I, I, I think to be a successful entrepreneur, you really do have to be somewhat difficult and somewhat stubborn. Uh, and I think that that's a lot easier to do when you have, and, and you make time for 
that clarity of this is the world I want. This is the future I want to live in. This is, this is what I want to contribute. And I think by doing that, you know, if, if anything, I feel like I've kind of created a little bit of a portfolio of tools that I use to stay energized, focused, um, resilient as challenges show up. The other thing that I would also say is I know enough entrepreneurs and I've been doing this long enough that whoever says that they're like drinking out of a fire hose of awesome and there are no problems, you know, the biggest problem they have is that they, you know, have, have too much success. I know it's a lot of BS. Uh, and I think that that's helpful in just remembering, you know, not everybody should do this. This path is not for the faint of heart. Um, I appreciate the fact that I've chosen it. I have committed to getting good at it. And I have a clear picture of the future I want to live in. Okay. That's a great answer. One of the other challenges that you and I have talked about, and I'm not sure if you're going to be comfortable talking about it today or not, yeah. is the fact that you are, um, you are a woman in tech, uh, that, that, that the tech has not always been uh, embracing um, of women. Um, and so one of the other qualities I think that has served you extraordinarily well is not taking things personally. Um, you, you're famous in my class for having to come in class to come coming to class once and saying, um, you know, people accuse women in tech of sleeping their way to the top. And your quote was, if women were sleeping their way to the top, there'd be a hell of a lot more women on top. <laughs> and I don't know if you recall saying that, but, but, I th but I thought it was very clever. But one of the things I think that you have also built in addition to the persistence and resilience is, is a, is an ability to let comments roll off you. To not worry about whether you're, uh, uh, you know, a man or a woman or worry about, you know, how many women there are in tech or how many women aren't in tech or what, what is going on. That you, you, you built a, a, a reasonably, I think, thick skin in the sense of not taking stuff personally. Right. Is that a fair comment? I think that's a fair comment. I, I, would, I would tweak it a little bit, which is just, I was very fortunate in whether it was high school or college or certainly like my first job out of school, the, the women that I was friends with, especially my first job out of school friends who are still my friends today. We also, you know, not only were we, were we comfortable, like, you know, when things hurt crying in the bathroom, but we also had a sense of humor about it. I think it is, an absolutely underappreciated uh, talent or muscle to really look at things with an eye towards the, the absurdity of it. And the absurdity of it is so hilarious that you really like nine out of 10 things you can't make up. They're so ridiculous. And so I do think that there's, you're, you're making a really interesting point that I hadn't sort of really crystallized, which is if you take every slight, if you take, um, I mean, I actually had this happen to me recently, <laughs> recently, I was in a meeting and it was like a fancy meeting um, without giving away too many details, but somebody had like literally taken an idea that I had and, and used it as their own without acknowledging me. And I was in the room. And so I like knew what was happening. And so I had this moment where I was like, if you don't actually have a sense of humor about how ridiculous things are, um, you really do, you're gonna get exhausted. 
And so, you know, there, I, I can absolutely see the, the criticism of this point of view, which is, you know, but these things are serious and, um, you know, are you letting them go if you think they're funny as opposed to like tackling them head on? And I think it's one of the, the reasons why I've always appreciated, you know, the study of power and the way that you have framed it, which is something that I've had to ask myself a lot, which is, would I rather be right or effective? And I'm very clear that within, you know, within a, a boundary of integrity and a boundary of my values and ethics, I'd rather be effective. I would rather build something that people use and I would rather win than be right but bitter mm. i don't want to be right and bitter i want to be i want to be effective i want to i want to unlock opportunity for people i want to bring something new into the world and i actually want to have fun doing it mm. so i know i'm gonna ask you one final question you i know you have served on the board of a variety of publicly traded media companies you were today on the board of Tegna. Prior to that, I think you were on the board of Scripps. Tell me about how your public board service um, has fit, fits in uh, to your life and your career, and how you and how you think about doing that. Yeah, I've. So I actually think that there are two things about being on a public board that I've really enjoyed. Number one is sometimes it's really nice to get on a plane go to somebody else's headquarters, see totally different people and tackle a business and their challenges and what they do and then fly back and fly back and show up the next day with just a different perspective and fresh perspective. That has been incredibly fun and valuable. And, you know, if I, if I do my job right, hopefully I'm bringing value to the boards that I have or do sit on. Um, I sort of think that is like so far so good. The second thing is that it is really fun to be in a board dynamic where you're meeting all these other cool people. So, you know, when, when I get really clear about, you know, again, why I do what I do and what I like the best and how I define success. So beyond kind of having my basic needs met, money is interesting to me, but it's not my main motivator. It's, as I've said, you know, my, my main motivator is I want to live in this world where we have, you know, brick by brick or, you know, bit by bit created this future where people are members of amazing communities that are powered by software and AI that, you know, was not even possible six months ago. And how I define success is being surrounded every day with people who are interesting, curious, ambitious, uh, and bring to the picnic something I can learn from. And again, hopefully create experiences that bring joy and bring new ideas and creating things that haven't been created before. So sitting on boards where I get to know people that, you know, come at things very differently than I do has just been a, a tremendous gift. And it's, it's great. I will say that I think there's, there's been this sort of um, holding up boards, especially for sort of women and, and people of color as, as like, that's the goal. Like that's the, you know, that's the, the pinnacle of success is that you're on public boards. And I'm like, it's pretty cool. I like it. I'm glad that I've done it. Uh, it's not the only way to have impact. It's not the only way to have success. And I think that the more 
that the conversation and definition of how we uh, describe and and look to what success means, I think, I think there's there's more opportunity for broader definitions. Thank you, Gina. It's been an interesting conversation, and I very much appreciate your wisdom and insight, which is uh, which well, is right back at you. I'm glad we started off with like <laughs> my burning question about how do you look at all of this through the lens of you know this moment through the lens of power, power dynamics, especially yeah. as it relates to like the people around them. And uh, there's so much, so much to, to, to dissect. And it's a great, it's a great reason to go back and read the seven, the seven Seven rules of power. To me, it's always like the yellow cover book or the blue cover book. I like that. There you go. That's how I do it. I know. I'm old school. This episode, we have talked to the famous good friend, Gina Bianchini. Thank you, Gina, for being with us. My pleasure.